The only way to hold a piece of ground on this world, or any other world, is a man with a rifle. Hey guys, Pete here. This will be my breakdown of For All Mankind Season 2 Episode 3. The episode's titled Rules of Engagement. And this video will include spoilers if you haven't watched it yet. So we open with a news report about Panama. Four U.S. soldiers have been taken hostage. And if you're wondering what's going on in Panama, they address the situation there in one of those shorts that they put out to go along with episode one to fill in the blanks of what happened. This is one of those things I left out of my timeline video because I wasn't exactly sure what the implications of it were going to be. Now we're starting to see that. In the news clip, we see that the U.S. President Ronald Reagan is blaming the Soviet Union. And part of the reason why Panama is important is related to the space program. The Sea Dragon rockets, which deliver heavy payloads to the moon, are launched near Guam in the Pacific Ocean. So they're dependent on the Panama Canal to get materials from the mainland out to the middle of the Pacific Ocean. On the moon, we see that the lithium mining site that the U.S. has established has been taken over by the Soviets. The lithium itself is a big deal. It took a lot of time and resources to locate it. There's a lot of it, so it's worth a lot of money. And the idea of giving it up isn't anything anyone's on board with. The president wants NASA to take it back, and to hold it will require them to watch it 24-7. To do this, Ed and Bradford realize that they're going to need armed security, and armed security means guns. Everyone else is opposed to the idea. But if you think about it, Bradford and Ed are probably right. It's not something that they can just do, though. They have to modify weapons, and they don't really have anyone up there who's trained to operate them. This brings up the idea that they're going to need Marines, because all of their aviators have to train in ground combat first. This idea doesn't go over well with Payne and the others, although in reality, there were Marines involved with the U.S. space program. John Glenn was a Marine. Bradford delivers the quote that I opened the video with, and that does seem to get through to them. And before we cut away, Ed brings up the idea that once we do this thing, there's no going back which sure feels like it has implications about where this season is going. Later, Bradford asks Ed in his office about the time when the Soviet cosmonaut was in Jamestown base. Ed is reluctant to believe that something might have happened while he was there, but a little later in the episode, they sweep Jamestown base, and they do find a recording device above the light. So it turns out for the last nine years, the Soviets have been able to listen in to what's going on in the base. This is one of the more interesting developments here because Ed is devastated. No doubt he feels responsible, and you could make an argument that he is. So I'm really curious to see how he reacts to this in relation to the space program itself. Like his place in it, his guilt for what happened, and how he deals with that. One of the areas that I found less interesting in the Ed Baldwin story was his adopted daughter Kelly making her decision that she wants to go to the Naval Academy. This plays out over several scenes. First, she tells Karen, and Karen is completely against it. She's not supportive at all at first. They get into a fight, and we see where Karen's fear is coming from. She went through that period of time when Ed was in Korea, not knowing what was going on with him. She's lost her son. And I don't find it not interesting because it doesn't work. It all really does work by itself. It just feels like it spreads the story a little thin. Either way, later in the episode, Kelly finds Shane's Popeye toy in her room. Karen comes in, she apologizes, and eventually gives her her blessing to go to the Naval Academy. And they both think that Ed is going to be really excited about this, that she wants to follow in his footsteps. When he comes home, that doesn't happen at all. He actually flips out. And we've seen this side of him several times throughout the series, so it tracks. He tells her he won't support it. Kelly tells him that she'll just go down and enlist in the Navy. He says that she'll have to leave the house if she does that. He gets more and more unhinged, and then Karen intervenes, and it gets pretty crazy. And all the way through this part of it, I was right there with them. It was intense. You could feel the emotion. And the idea is there that, you know, he's been suppressing this idea that he wasn't there when Shane died, that it was at least partly his fault. 
and things cool down and they come back together. And then it took kind of a weird turn, I thought, as Karen tells him he's not responsible for what happened. And then they all sing the Navy's fight song, Anchors Away, together. I think there were a couple things that didn't work here for me, but I think it can all be summed up with this part where Kelly starts to sing and Karen goes, oh, please no. And it seemed like to me when I was watching that, wow, the show's self-aware. They realize they don't really need to go there. They don't really need a sing-along. But then they just continue to sing. So to me, it seemed a little dragged out. Like I got the point early, what was going on here. And then they just kept going where I didn't think it was as effective anymore. The interesting thing that sticks out here, though, beyond the obvious thing that they're setting Kelly up to be important later in the story, is that Ed has been blaming himself because it happened while he was on the moon. And that implies that that's probably the reason he never went back to the moon since then. So this could open the door for him to go back, especially in light of the fact that Jamestown's had this recording device inside it ever since he was there the last time. So the Kelly stuff, I get it. It's going to be important later. I don't really love watching it now, but I'm sure it's going to pay off. And we see that in the Margot and Alita timeline because the Alita parts in season one seemed a little bit out of place. And I have to admit that this reintroduction really did work for me in this episode. I'm really curious to see what's going on with Alita. Just to recap, we see Margot arrive at a trailer park. We learn that Alita lives there. There's the awkward introduction where she has to help her with the toilet paper because she's out of it and she's in the bathroom. And we learn that Alita's going to be deported if she doesn't have a job. That she's a gifted engineer, but she keeps getting fired. She's basically worked everywhere. Boeing, Abbott, McDonnell Douglas. And when Margot looked into it, all of those guys that fired her still said that she was a gifted engineer. One of the best that they've ever worked with. Between these two, though, we can see that there's a real tension and feelings about their past. The takeaway from the ending of season one was that Margot turned her away, thinking that she would be all right staying with the woman she was already with. When Alita went back there, the place was cleared out. And before she took off on her own, she lied to her father on the phone saying Margot agreed to let her stay. Is that what they're talking about? Have these two not seen each other since that day nine years ago? And how did Alita get from that place to working at all these big aerospace companies? What she was doing in that period of time brings up a lot of questions. In the end, there is a job offer. It seems like Margot has regrets about the past, but she's trying to offer a practical solution for the real problem of deportation that Alita's facing. It's definitely interesting. I like the grown-up version of the character so far. Later, after Margot leaves, we see Alita fight with her boyfriend over the fact that he brought Margot into their lives. She says it's the one person she didn't want help from. But in the end, she agrees that she'll take the job only to break up with the boyfriend for going behind her back. It appears that she will be working at JSC. It doesn't sound like she's starting off in anything important, but it will obviously lead to something paying off all the introduction time that we spent with her in the first season. And that just leaves us with Gordo and Tracy. We see that Tracy is sleeping in, waking up, taking a swig of beer, having her housekeeper call in to say she's going to be late. We learn that Gordo called her and left a message. At his house, we see that he doesn't fit in his uniform anymore, and there's a pretty funny scene where he breaks the zipper. He does make it to his class. Danny jokes about him about not being in uniform, and we see that they have laptops in the class, which seems to be another example of the development of technology being sped up a little bit in this timeline. Later, we see Tracy come into the outpost, and it's very noticeable that she's drinking heavily here. At first, Karen's distracted with the Kelly news. Tracy does give her some good advice there. And then all that drinking leads to her wrecking her Porsche on the way home after she sees a billboard of herself. Because her husband's out of town, she calls Gordo to come pick her up. She pukes in his car and insists that he take her back to their old house, his house. And as he's getting the couch together, she takes off her clothes and goes into the bed and takes it from him. The next morning, he takes the keys to the house back before Tracy leaves and they argue about it. She pretty coldly laughs in his face when he says he's going back to the moon and he explains that he's on Jamestown 91 that Columbia will be taking him back in September and she realizes she's going to the moon on Discovery and that they're going to be there at the same time he's hurt because he's going back to the moon for the first time in 10 years and the only thing she seems worried about is the publicity 
And we see more of that when she goes to Ed's office and tries to get Gordo bumped from his flight. They also argue, and in the end, he's still going. Tracy believes that Gordo came to him and asked, but as viewers, we know Ed is doing this because he's trying to pull Gordo out of that dark place that he's in. And it's a little bit hard to square for me why this is such a big deal. They mentioned Shorty Powers, who's a real person in our timeline that worked for NASA. And her problem is that she's worried that they're going to try to force this into a situation they can use for publicity. She says she won't play the Astro Wife again. So it's there. I don't know. It's not the most exciting thing for me. But if you think about the scenes that she's been in so far this season, she does seem to be on the edge of something going wrong in her life. And probably the thing I was most curious about for either character was the closing shot where we see Gordo in his bed and the TV cuts out. He goes and turns it off. He lays down and then he sees red lights in the distance. And of course, this brings us back to whenever things started going wrong for him on the moon. It turns out it's just his VCR and he has a laugh about it. But it underlines the idea that there is some concern with him going back to the moon. And so the episode ends there, and I think overall it was still pretty good, even though there were some parts I didn't like as much as others. My take on the Anchors Away scene, the sing-along not being necessary, may turn out to be an unpopular opinion, but it did remind me of parts in the first season where I thought that the number of things that they're trying to do all at the same time sort of took away from the overall experience. The whole idea of the situation with the Soviets, how things on Earth are impacting how they decide to do things on the moon, there's a cool dynamic there where there's just a few people on the moon overall, but what happens between them has really big implications, and they're separated from us in that way. They're out in space, you know? Ed finding out about the listening device makes me wonder about where his story's headed in this season. In the previous episode, there was this idea of putting together a publicity stunt, a handshake in space between the U.S. and the USSR. It was kind of pushed aside at the time because there was other things going on and because Payne said that it was never going to happen either way. All of this is starting to point to me thinking that this is going to happen and there's going to be far-reaching implications. And of course, the idea of taking guns to the moon is obviously going somewhere. And I think that's a good place to leave it. So let me know in the comments what you thought about this episode, what you think about this season so far. Please like this video if you enjoyed it. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. And thanks for watching, guys. I'll talk to you soon.